What central direction there was in the Confederacy was mostly directed at the Army. The Confederacy existed as long as the Confederate Army was uh, in the field. Um, but this, but the Army, Army policies also generated a lot of internal opposition in the Confederacy. Most of it focused on the draft. The Confederacy institutes the first conscription in American history in 1862. The U.S. follows in 1863. And impressment by the Army, which is related but not the same thing as this tax and kind, where the Army will just seize things from farms and give the owner a kind of receipt for future payment, but that doesn't do you much good at the moment. The draft in the Confederacy um, eventually was extended to cover all able-bodied men from age 17 to 50, a very large range of ages. But interestingly, they had a number of exemptions. Some critical occupations were exempted, like railroad workers, miners. The Confederacy did have a provision for religious conscientious objectors. There were certain religious groups like Moravians, for example, in North Carolina who were in principle opposed to you know, violence and were exempted from military service. And as in the North, if you're drafted, you could provide a substitute or pay to get out of the army. This is true in both sides. The draft allows you to either, if you're drafted, you can pay someone else to go in your place, and you work that out individually with that person, or pay the, I think in the South it's $500. Pay the government $500 to be exempted from the army. Obviously, that's a class-based measure, right? That means the well-to-do people can buy their way out of the army, whereas $500 is a lot of money back then. It's certainly more than the annual income of most poorer uh, farmers. Um, and then in 1862, they pass the so-called 20 Negro Law. One able-bodied white male is exempted from the draft for every 20 black people, slaves, on a plantation. For every 20 slaves, one white person is exempted for the draft. Why? Well, obviously, that's to try to keep discipline on the plantations. This measure enraged large numbers of poorer white uh, Confederates. Uh, it was clearly class-based, obviously. So in other words, a planter, if he wanted, could keep his son out of the army if he owned 20 slaves. A poorer white family that owned five or six slaves, maybe, or two or three, didn't have the option for that exemption. Why, now, actually, in the Janap book, you see some of the debate over it, pro and con. Why is this necessary in the first place? It's because of the growing disintegration of slavery. If the slaves were all totally placid, if the slaves were just working away, no problem, this would not be necessary. But as slaves began to run away, or even far from Union lines, just become more and more recalcitrant on plantations and more willing to challenge the authority of those who remain, but who is in charge on the plantations now? It's women, elderly or infirm men, children, um, Slaves are finding it easier to assert themselves as the war goes on, and the Confederate government has to respond to that. The 20 Negro Law is a response to the growing assertiveness of blacks on the, uh, on the ground level. But in other words, this is the syllogism, the syllogism for explaining um, Confederate defeat in some parts. Slavery creates the Confederacy. But the war leads to the disintegration of slavery. The disintegration of slavery leads the Confederate government to adopt policies to strengthen and preserve slavery. Those policies sunder white society. In other words, if you are fighting a war to, for the independence of the South, that's one thing. If you are fighting a war just to defend slavery, that's another thing. And that's what it seems increasingly that the policies of the Confederate government are being geared to protecting the institution of slavery. 
uh, which many, many white families do not benefit from. There are other grounds of internal opposition also. One is, just as in the North, the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, that is, rounding up people, arresting them without, you know, a charge, throwing them in jail, happens both North and South. Um, and uh, there were arbitrary arrests, especially of unionists in, we'll talk in a minute, of places like Eastern Tennessee, Western North Carolina, Germans in Texas. There were a group, I think a dozen or so Germans were executed in Texas, German immigrants, for opposing the Confederacy. But the most flagrant of these other abuses was uh, impressment. That is this policy I just mentioned of, um, uh, of the army seizing goods and paying for them in paper money, which disintegrate, which declines in value. In, now, eventually, impressment comes to include taking slaves for military labor. The result of that is large numbers of planters begin what they call refugeeing their slaves, a funny usage. They become refugees. They refugee the slaves. What does that mean? It means moving themselves and their slaves away from the Union Army, which is pretty easy to understand, but also away from the Confederate Army. They don't want the Confederate Army seizing their slaves, because once slaves are working for the Confederate Army, they're going to be near Union lines, and they can escape much more easily, right, than if they're down in the heart of, of Alabama somewhere. So a large number of planters, particularly in the Deep South, move with their slaves across the Mississippi River into Texas, into Arkansas. They're not willing to give up their slaves, you see, or have their control of their slaves compromised by the war effort. Um, McCurry cites a letter by a poorer white saying, they are willing to send their sons to the army, but not their slaves. What kind of logic is that? They're leaving to keep their slaves from being taken up by the army. So, um, so all this uh, is, is an example of this, you know, internal discord which is growing as the war goes on in the Confederacy. In some ways, it's reflected in Southern politics. Um, some governors become serious obstructionists. Uh, in the Janap book, you have Governor Joe Brown of Georgia. Now, Brown was a representative of the poorer whites, the Mioman whites of northern Georgia, but, and in fact had been elected governor before the war, and, you know, he's pro-Confederate, he's the governor of the state in the, in the war, but, um, but um, he's a representative of northern and western Georgia, and um, he fights for state power. This is the state's rights killed the Confederacy argument. He fights for state power within the Confederacy. He objects to Confederate commanders appointing non-Georgians to command Georgian so Georgia soldiers. Um, he engages in a lengthy pamphlet debate with President Jefferson Davis over the draft. Uh, he says, the draft is completely unconstitutional. I cannot consent to commit the state to a policy which in my judgment is subversive of her sovereignty and at war with the principles for which we have entered this revolution. He threatens nullification. Remember John C. Calhoun. Brown threatens to nullify the draft law in, in Georgia. And in 1864, as Sherman is marching through Georgia, uh, in the fall of 1864, Brown furloughs 10,000 Georgia soldiers because they have to go home and help harvest the crops of their families. It's harvest season. So again, Brown is not pro-Northern, but he is not willing to, to sacrifice, so to speak, his own state autonomy for the general Confederate war effort. 